As they come, I want to read you a verse from Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10. It says, Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe in my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. What an amazing thing is this process that we call birth. And even more amazing is what happens when a little girl like Carissa grows. In an all too brief span of time, this infant, so vulnerable and dependent, becomes a child, rapidly learning how to crawl and then to walk, moving from cries to words and sentences, growing in body, mind, and spirit toward adulthood. And parents have the tremendous opportunity to witness it all and the great responsibility to guide their children in this process. However, the most marvelous aspect of it all is that the very hand of God is involved in this parenting that so many of you have had the opportunity to be a part of and that Jason and Holly start on with their first child now. Scripture tells us that our Creator knows each child long before she enters this world, before she is even a dream in her mother's heart. God is present at birth, according to Psalm 139, 13 through 16. You took me from the womb, and through the nurturing years, you kept me safe in my mother's breast. Our faith informs us that our children belong to God and are entrusted into our hands but for a season. Parenting at its best is a calling from God through, through those years to love and to protect and to challenge and to gradually release these precious children. Parenting will require every resource that we have and then some. You already know about some of the sleepless nights and some of the things that come with that. From walking the halls at 2 a.m. with the crying infant to waiting up past midnight for a tardy teenager, parenting isn't for the weak of heart. The good news is that parents don't do this alone. Jesus himself spoke of God's mother-like desire to gather her children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings in Matthew 22. He also told of God's patience, which is like a father waiting for a prodigal son in Luke 15. The Lord is there all along the way of a child's growth, and many are the resources of our maker that he provides if we'll only ask and seek and find in him. This room, this sanctuary today, is full of many hearts and hands whom God has drawn together into a family of faith that we call Woodbury Community Church. Within the church of Jesus Christ, no parent should ever have to stand alone. No child is without many spiritual aunts and uncles and sisters and brothers. We're here to help bear this awesome and exciting responsibility of raising children. Will they grow in faith in Christ? Will they hear stories of Jesus? Will his words be lived out before them so they will know and the truth and the truth will set them free? Will they be encouraged to walk by faith little by little, be forgiven when they fall, be challenged one day to undertake the greatest journey of them all, to follow Jesus into the waters of baptism and beyond? To answer those questions is our mission. And church, we've got to say, are we ready for that? We believe that through our... um, family here, through children's ministries, through student ministry, that we're going we're gonna to support you the best that we can. Jason and Holly, you've brought your precious daughter before the, con- to the congregation to consecrate her to the Lord, something that Jesus' parents did with him on the uh, first week that he was alive, and to dedicate yourself to the task of parenting. In preparation for today, I asked you to pick some verses out that were special to you, that it would be hopefully special to your daughter someday. And you picked out 1 John 3, 1 through 3, verses that will appear on the certificate of dedication that you'll receive from the church later today. Those verses say this, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as pure. I'm going to light a candle today. And this candle represents the fact that we believe with all of our hearts that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, that Jesus is present with us here today, and our hope that one day Carissa will come to know the light of the world, as her Lord and her Savior. And so the time has come for some promises today, promises from Jason and from Holly first, and then from grandparents, and then from godparents, and then from you, the congregation. And so first for Jason and for Holly, will you pledge to love and support Carissa, 
by providing the opportunity for her to grow up in the family of faith with the hope that she will someday confess Christ as her teacher and Lord and Savior? If so, answer, we will. We will. And will you, to the best of your ability and with God's help, provide a loving family environment in which Carissa can grow in love and loyalty and obedience to God? And will you encourage Carissa to grow in faith so that she might later be received into the fellowship of the church by membership, fully partaking in the work and worship of the church? Now I have the opportunity to ask a couple of sets of grandparents. I'm going to turn so I can see both of you some questions. Blessed is the child who has faithful and loving grandparents. Not only do you who stand with this young family today thoroughly enjoy and help nurture this precious child in your own and unique ways, which... You're just learning, she's so young, that you also support her parents through the wonder-filled and sometimes frustrating process of parenting. Will you likewise pledge to support and encourage and love Carissa and her parents through these awesome years to the best of your ability? If so, answer, we will. Wonderful. And you also have godparents, and that is Holly's sister and her husband. Godparents fill a special role in the life of a child. In participating in the role of godparents, you promise to participate in the life of this child, doing everything in your power and the strength of God to assist the parents in the spiritual nurture of this child. Do you, as godparents of this child, promise to share the responsibility with Jason and Holly for this precious child, to pray for her, to walk with her in the way of Christ, and to help her take her place within the life and worship of Christ Church? If so, answer, we will. And now it's your turn, congregation. We have a slide that we're going to put up on the screen that we put up every time we have a dedication here. And I want to encourage you, if you will commit to standing with this family and helping to be spiritual aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters to Carissa and encouragement to Jason and Holly, would you stand and would you repeat these words with me? You have offered your child to the strong and tender providence of God. We rejoice with you and give thanks for the gift of your child. We promise with humility and seriousness to share in your child's nurture and well-being. We will support by our example and words your efforts to provide a loving and caring home where trust in God grows and Christ's way is chosen. Our prayers will be with you and for you. May our shared life and witness help make your task both joyful and fruitful. Congregation, you may be seated. And I am going to take this precious child out of the arms of her father, where she has been so content. Oh, yes, I know. And I want to bring her down here a little bit and allow you to see her. This is a beautiful Carissa. And a couple of things the family wanted me to share with you. She's wearing a dress that uh, is a family heirloom, over 70 years old. Her mother wore this dress when she was baptized. Her grandmother wore this dress. It's possible that her great-grandmother wore this dress. Her aunts and great-aunts have worn this dress, and she has a beautiful little cross on that is a gift from her godparents as well. And our prayer for little Carissa is that she will be a champion for Christ in her generation, that she will be a child who will grow to love the Lord with all of her heart and her soul and her mind and her strength, that she'll understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and live for that with all of her life. So Carissa, Adeline Price, I'm going to take you back up by mom and dad. You are dedicated to the Lord. May all of the resources of home and family and church nurture you and encourage you toward your own decision for Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for little Carissa. God, she's your child. We pray that you would bless her all of the days of her life. She was created in the image of Jesus Christ. She was created that she might glorify you, and we pray that that would be the case. That, God, she would choose to follow you all the days of her life. That she would come to know you as a young girl. That she would be somebody who pleases you and is a champion for you and her generation. We pray for her parents, for her family, for her godparents. 
and for the church as we raise her in the faith. Lord, we thank you that you have blessed her with a Christian family, with a family, with a mom and a dad who have made commitments to sacrifice for her, to love her, to raise her in a way that pleases you. We pray your strength on them. We pray that you would give them wisdom and strength every step of the way. We praise you so much for the gift of this precious baby. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give her back to Dad here. I'm going to take this candle. I'm going to give this to her godmother. And Carissa, as I do that, my final little statement to this little one is, May your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Give this certificate to you. Thank you. Yeah, we love you. We're so happy for you. This time, our ushers. Yeah, you can clap for these guys. What a special day. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this point. Father, we thank you for little Carissa. And Lord, I thank you for the many in this room who have experienced a similar thing. We thank you for the family of faith. Lord, there are teenagers and there are um, college students and there are others who years ago were dedicated in this church. Lord, there are adults who years ago were dedicated in this church and are raising their own children. And uh, God, we just thank you for the gift of the family of faith. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for Jesus. And again, we pray that uh, you would use this church to continue to share your message around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. very much. So we're in week number three of a series through the book of Genesis. It is a long book. It is a long series, and uh, it is an exciting series. But I have a confession to make this morning right from the get-go on uh, on this particular message. I'm not good at what we're going to talk about today. In fact, I wish with all my heart that we had a guest speaker scheduled for today, or I wish that when Genesis was written that Genesis 2, 1 through 3 fell like in Genesis 50. So I had a bunch of weeks in a row where I could practice what I'm going to preach today. Uh, Again, I'm just not good at it. 
Too often I've lived my life at a frantic pace. I've allowed myself to put too much on my plate. Maybe you're like me. Uh, Too often my self-esteem has been based on what I do instead of who I am in Christ. I don't take enough time to rest, and I've used food as a way to deal with stress in my life on more occasions than I want to admit. I'm too busy, and I need to change all of that. All of that needs to change. It's uh, never easy for a pastor to preach on a topic that brings so much personal conviction to him. Again, I I wish I had a guest speaker today. Here are some things that I know to be true in my life. And based upon the conversations that I've had with many of you, I know them to be true in many of your lives as well. Uh, There are things that used to bring me joy in life that don't bring me as much joy anymore. I found that I'm tired way too often, that I live on the brink, that I'm I'm spent. And much like the old Sheryl Crow lyric, I have a feeling that I'm not the only one here this morning. I think there's a lot of you that can relate to that feeling. Americans tend to live lives of busyness. I once worked for an organization that prided itself with this uh, statement. They said, we don't encourage workaholism, but we sure don't discourage it either. And everyone and the organization that I work with had this need to please our managers with these workaholic tendencies. And I was really good at not discouraging them. The biblical concept of a Sabbath was something that I ignored all of the years I worked for that organization. And truth be told, it's a concept that I've ignored for much too much of my life. Again, maybe you're like me. Maybe this word Sabbath seems like some outdated and archaic command. But Sabbath rest is something that God didn't just demonstrate in the seventh day of creation, which we'll talk about today, but he commanded it in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. For the past two weeks, we've looked at the first chapter of Genesis. We ended last week with the last verse in the first chapter of Genesis. And that verse is, and God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And biblical scholars say that The guy who decided where all of the chapters and the verses would be divided in the Old Testament got it wrong on Genesis 1 and where Genesis 2 starts. Hughes, who I quote a lot here, writes, Stephanus, the 16th century printer scholar who introduced the verse divisions of the Bible that we use today, simply blew it. He should have seen this because Genesis 2-1 is an echo of Genesis 1-1, which begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Genesis 2.1 concludes, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. The echo is technically called an inclusio, which indicates the conclusion of the six days of creation. The story is that Stephanus made his verse divisions while he was riding on horseback. So maybe we shouldn't be too tough on this guy, Stephanus, all right? Genesis 2, 1 through 3, kind of a a, a complete thought in Scripture says this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in heaven. And I know it's just three verses But there is so much depth in those verses. We talked last week about the fact that the number seven is an important number in Genesis 1. You see it all over uh, Genesis 1. But in this statement from Genesis 2, 1 to 3, uh, in the original Hebrew, there are actually four little lines that are given, and every one of those lines have seven Hebrew words, this idea of perfection. The word that you see rested in verses 2 and 3 is a word that would better be translated to cease from. So God um, ceases from his work of creation, but he doesn't stop working. And this rest that God takes from his creative work is something that God sees as absolutely beautiful. It will become a defining mark for God's people. First, he'll command the children of Israel to honor the Sabbath and to keep it holy. When Jesus comes on the scene, and then when he is crucified and he is buried and he is risen again, the early church takes this Sunday, the resurrection day, and moves the Sabbath to a Sunday to celebrate that day as a holy day for God. 
It's a day to remember. It's a day to stop our normal work and engage in a deliberate time of reflecting upon God, of enjoying the company of others to feast and to rest. But again, it doesn't mean that no work whatsoever happens on the Sabbath day. In fact, Jesus took the legalism of his day. The teaching when Jesus was around was, was that you couldn't even lift a finger on the Sabbath. I mean, you can't walk too far. You can't get water. You can't, all these things that, that people couldn't do on the Sabbath. And so Jesus shows up and he begins to heal people on the Sabbath day. And the religious leaders are like, hold up, Jesus, you're breaking the Sabbath. What are you doing healing these sick people on the Sabbath? And they were following the letter of the law, but didn't quite get the spirit of the law. And Jesus addresses this idea that there, there is absolutely no work, this oppressive legalistic teaching that had come into Jewish society in John five seventeen. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Hughes writes, God rested from creating, but works in sustaining the world by his power governing it by his providence and ensuring the propagation of its creatures. In fact, if he stopped working, everything would dissolve into nothing. God's rest was one of deep pleasure and satisfaction at the fruit of his labor. Okay, that doesn't get us off the hook. We're still people that are supposed to rest. And it's a command that God gives. I told you it was in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 28 through 11. The Lord, through Moses, gives a message to the children of Israel. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now I told you at the beginning of the message, I haven't done a real great job of this in my life. A few years ago, 18 of us from Woodbury Community Church had an opportunity to travel to the nation of Israel. It's one of the highlights of my life. All six of the Schulenberg family were there. There were many others from our church. And while in Israel, I had an opportunity to experience Shabbat as the people of Israel do, the Sabbath. From sundown on Friday night until sundown on Saturday, the Jewish people rest. They cease from their normal routine of their work in favor of a time with family and friends and most importantly, God. There are shared meals. Work has been done ahead of time. There is a ceasing of worrying about the things that consume their minds throughout the week. And it's beautiful. I'll never forget my first Shabbat in Israel. We had a chance to spend two of them there. Our ministry partners gathered us around the table. And we sang the traditional Shabbat song, which my boys still know to this day. I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to make them sing it. Um, but it's just the song that is sung to say, hey, this is it. This is different. There is this celebration that is about to take place. And today is different than any other day. And so everybody sings this Shabbat song. And then there is a meal that is shared and there are prayers that are shared and there is time that is taken to enjoy each other's company and there is this sacred rhythm that is part of their life that I loved and that I wish was a part of my life today. In her book, Sacred Rhythms, Ruth Haley Barton writes the following. Since I couldn't get a guest speaker, I decided to quote some people who are doing this a lot better than me. She writes, several years ago, I was run over by a car while riding my bike. Actually, it was a minivan driven by an elderly man whose reflexes were not what they used to be. He was stopped waiting to pull out of a parking lot, and I was riding on a sidewalk that had passed in front of it. Instead of remaining stopped and yielding the right of way, he began pulling out of the driveway just as I was crossing in front of him. It was one of those slow motion moments. I could see what was about to happen, but I couldn't do anything to stop it. And we collided. I fell, and his front tires drove onto my legs, which were intertwined with my bike, and actually came to rest on top of my legs. He threw the car into reverse, and the back tires spun because they couldn't get any traction. There was this moment of utter stillness and clarity when I thought, I hope he gets the car off me soon because it really hurts. 
To make a long story short, he was able to back the car off me. But he was so dazed by what had happened that he just got out and wandered into the street not knowing what to do. Fortunately, an ambulance just happened to be passing by. And the paramedics jumped out, scooped me off the pavement, put me in the ambulance, and whisked me away to the emergency room. In what could have been a devastating accident, I ended up with only cuts and bruises and a fractured ankle. The first feeling to set in as I got situated back home was euphoria. If there had been a moment's difference in, my ti- in the timing, my whole body could have been run over rather than just my legs, so I was grateful to be alive and in one piece. The doctor expressed amazement that my legs had been able to hold up under the weight of the vehicle. Needless to say, our family sat around that night, wide-eyed with relief, realizing that the outcome could have been altogether different. But eventually, the relief gave way to other areas of levels of awareness. One friend, after expressing his initial concern, laughingly commented, Hey, Ruth, when are you going to learn that when you're on your bike, you can't take on a van? Another friend, concerned that I wasn't taking enough time to fully recover, said, You know, you really are allowed to take a break. You did just get run over by a car. And then there was this sentence from Wayne Muller's book, Sabbath that kept buzzing around my head like a pesky fly buzzing around a window pane. If we do not allow for a rhythm of rest in our overly busy lives, illness becomes our Sabbath. Our pneumonia, our cancer, our heart attack, our accidents create Sabbath for us. She says, I didn't want to hear this. I didn't want to consider the fact that perhaps this accident, while it was not God's fault, was a way God was trying to tell me something. I did not want to acknowledge the possibility that it was hard for God to get my attention. I did not want to face the fact that for years I had been thumbing my nose at human limitations, believing as though I was beyond needing a Sabbath. It was nice for retired people or people that weren't all that busy, but I wasn't one who needed a Sabbath. And you know, maybe that's you today. For years, your pastor has foolishly believed, I don't need a Sabbath. I can just keep going. I can keep going. There's one more meeting, one more thing, one more thing to do, one more deadline, one more tyranny. And maybe you found yourself at a spot where life's caught up with you. Anxiety, health issues, troubles in your marriage, your family, your job, your finances have forced you into a season of unexpected rest. But it is anything but joyful. In Isaiah 58, 13 to 14, we read the following. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight in the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Listen, God intended for the Sabbath to be something that we delight in. Not for it to be this drudgery. But for too many of us, true Sabbath has been crowded out by busyness. Just as our weeks are busy with work, our weekends have been consumed with running from one sporting event to another, one appointment to another, working a second job just to make ends meet, or filling our time with something so that we have no space for contemplation, for deep conversation with God and others, or for pure relaxation. Mark Buchanan writes about the importance of taking a Sabbath. He writes that Sabbath imparts the rest of God, actual, physical, mental, spiritual rest but also the rest of God, the things of God's nature and presence we miss in our busyness. Sabbath in the long run is as essential to your well-being as food and water and as good as a wood fire on a cold day. I want to convince you, he writes in part, that setting apart an entire day, one out of seven, for feasting and resting and worship and play is a gift and not a burden and that neglecting that gift for too long will make your soul like soil, never fallow, hard and dry and spent. And some of you would say, amen, that's me. That's where I'm at today. I wonder when the last time was that you truly set aside 24 hours to honor the Sabbath. I'm going to tell you something. It takes work. 
if breaking this commandment is the norm in your life, can you imagine how different your life might look if you just had the courage to obey God, to take him at his word, to relish in his rest? It's been too long for me of living out of control in this area of my life. My family this year uh, did what they've done many years on New Year's Eve. They said, let's make some New Year's resolutions. And everybody had a New Year's resolution. They all put it up on the board and they said, okay, dad, what's your New Year's resolution? I said, I, I don't have one. What do you mean you don't have one? We all have a New Year's resolution. You've got to have a New Year's resolution. And I said, I just, you know, I just don't want to make some resolution that I don't mean with all my heart and that I'm going to break you know, a week or two from now when the temptation gets too big or whatever. And I, I just can't do it. About a week later, Dad, do you have a New Year's resolution yet? Dad, and about the end of January, I kind of made up something easy. And here, here's my New Year's resolution and just get off my back. But I, it wasn't you know, really where I was at. And some people, it just takes a little bit longer to learn than others. Okay, my family's doing great on theirs. It took me till March. It took me till this week to recognize that the resolution that I need to make in my life is that Sabbath becomes something that I'm serious about. And that I fight for Sabbath in my life. And that I lead as your pastor and as I lead as a husband and as a father in this area of my life. I want you to know that living in rhythm with what God has called us to do, I, I think is a good thing. I see it in other areas of my life. When I trust God and obey him and follow him in other areas of my life, guess what? God always shows up. God always follows through in his promise. Like many Americans, I've taken pride too often in being a workaholic, working kind of the 24-7 life. And I want to challenge the other 24-7 people in this room. I know we're a church full of type A, suburban St. Paul folks. That maybe 24-6 living is a better place to be. And maybe, you know, 8 to 10, 6 living is a better place to be. I want you to take 24 hours somewhere in your week and give it to the Lord for the purpose of Sabbath. I'm going to begin honestly trying my best to model this and live this out. And I want to give you permission to ask me, how you doing, Pastor? Because I need that accountability. And if it's something that you want to make a part of your life and you want accountability, you come ask me and say, hold me accountable and we'll hold each other accountable. Because there are benefits that come with it. I know many people who say, I, I just don't have 24 hours a week to honor Sabbath. In fact, I think people who take a Sabbath are just lazy. I don't know how in the world, you know, this is something that honors God. And to you, what I want to say again is that living your life this way actually takes work. Being somebody who will honor the Sabbath means that you've got to get your work done ahead of time so that you have those 24 hours to be able to do that. And again, that's one of those things where I, I've kind of been one of those procrastinators. I want to get it done the last minute. But in order to honor Sabbath, we need to work ahead of time to be able to do that. It's the opposite of laziness. God didn't create us to live this way that many of us have been living our lives. We're not wired to work the kind of hours, run the multitude of places, keep the kind of schedules, and consume the amount of goods that many of us do. And for too many people, that pace is killing us. Several years ago, I read a story that I shared with you in a sermon. And um, I had to read the story again this week for it to really hit me the way that it needed to hit me. Sometimes pastors read stories and we say, well, that'd be a great sermon illustration, kind of fits in with what I'm preaching. And we don't let the illustration impact us. It's a story about a, a, a radio DJ who worked the weekend shift. He had another job throughout the week. And so Saturday morning, um, he goes into his radio gig, job number two. And on the radio that day, he's kind of complaining about his life. He's complaining because he's missing one of his daughter's recitals and an old man calls him on the phone. DJ's name is Tom, and he says, well, Tom, it sure sounds like you're busy with your life. I'm sure they pay you well, but it's a shame that you have to be away from home and your family so much. Hard to believe a young fellow should have to work 60 or 70 hours a week to make ends meet. Too bad you missed your daughter's dance recital. Let me tell you something, Tom, something that's helped me keep a good perspective on my own priorities. You see, I sat down one day and did a little arithmetic. The average person lives about 75 years. I know some live more, some live less, but on average, folks live about 75 years. So now then I've multiplied 75 times 52, and I came up with 3,900, which is the number of Saturdays that the average person has in their entire lifetime. It took me until I was about 55 years old to think about any of this in detail. And by that time, I'd lived 2,800 Saturdays. And I got to thinking that if I lived to be 75, I only had about 1,000 of them left to enjoy. 
So I went to the toy store and I bought every single marble that they had. I ended up having to go to three toy stores to round up a thousand marbles. I took them home and I put them in a large clear plastic container right here in the shack next to my gear. And every Saturday since then, I have taken a marble and I've thrown it away. I found that by watching the marbles diminish, I focused more on the really important things in life. There's nothing like watching your time here on this earth run out to get your priorities straight. Now, let me tell you one last thing before I take my lovely wife to breakfast, he says. This morning, I took the very last marble out of the container. I figure if I can make it last until next Saturday, then I've been given a little extra time. And the one thing that we could all use is a little more time. So I found a store that sells marbles the other day, and I'm going to go buy some this week. And I'm going to start uh, throwing marbles away. And some of you might say, I've lost my marbles, but I'm going to do it, okay? I, I, I think it's a good idea. I think it's great advice to think about life. Is there a purposefulness to the way you're living your life, or are you flitting about from one thing to the next, allowing the tyranny of the urgent, the crisis of the moment, the loudest and the most persistent voice to dictate how and when you and your family spend their time? Psalm 131 is one of the shortest chapters in all the Bible. You want to do something really cool this week? Memorize Psalm 131. It's three verses, okay? So, in fact, teenagers, if you memorize Psalm 131 this next week, come see me next Sunday, and I'll give you five bucks if you tell me Psalm 131, okay? So five bucks, and I think it's like five minutes time, all right? Psalm 131, three verses, and this is it. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. I love the imagery of this song. It's written by King David as an old man, and it became so precious to the children of Israel that it was elevated to the status of a psalm of ascent, which means that every time they would go to Jerusalem, and most Jewish families went to Jerusalem at least once a month to offer a sacrifice at the temple, they would begin to walk up the steps of the temple. And as they walked up the steps of the temple, they would recite, which they had memorized, the psalms of ascent. And on one of those steps, they would recite Psalm 131. And they wouldn't move to the next step until they'd recited it. And do you think that the words of Psalm 31, that I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me, that coming before the Lord and saying, God, I'm quieting myself. I'm preparing myself for you to speak to me. Do you think that that had an impact in their lives? You know, many of us struggle with having hearts that long for Christ with all of the distractions that are continually before us. And I get it. I get the struggle. We live in a world where we have things continually competing for our attention. I drive every day from Eden Prairie to Woodbury to come in here to work, and I have radio stations that compete for my attention. I have billboards that compete for my attention. I have restaurants that compete for my attention. There are so many things that are trying to get my attention every single day. A couple years ago, I was listening to a radio show that said that the average child, and this was in 2012, growing up in America today, spends seven and a half hours in front of a screen. That screen might be a television set, a computer, a cell phone, a video game system, an iPad, an iPod, or something else. And Ironic, it's coming from a pastor preaching off of an iPad, okay? I get that, all right? So I'm, I'm at my son's band concert yesterday, and it was awesome. It was the district-wide band festival and the sixth grade all the way through the adult band in Eden Prairie do a song. And the junior high band, all of the junior hires in our school system get an iPad. And so a couple years ago, it was seven and a half hours. I bet my kids spend seven hours a day in school in front of a screen before they ever come home. And even the band concert was played off of the iPads on their screen. I mean, we live in an unbelievable world. There are distractions all around. Now, here's what the interview said. The average child growing up today spends less than 20 minutes a day outside in any kind of unstructured activity. And the person being interviewed said that God has revealed himself to us in two ways. There is the written revelation of God, which is the Bible that we have and that we ought to be reading every single day. And on Sabbath, paying even more attention to it so God can speak to us. And that's why many of you on Sunday 
the Sabbath day that we celebrate since the resurrection are here today. You're spending an extended amount of time in God's word. Second way God reveals himself to us is general revelation or that which he has created, nature. And the person being interviewed said, we are so busy that we don't take the time to experience God in his word or in nature. When's the last time you can say like David that you quieted yourself before God? When's the last time that you truly experienced a Sabbath? You know, there have been all sorts of experiments that have been done recently on noise. For instance, there was an experiment done at a university where somebody had a bunch of books in their arms in a library, and they purposely dropped the books to see in a quiet library how many people would come and help them after they dropped the books. And 50% of the people would come within, you know, seconds and help that person pick up their books. Then they ran the exact same experiment in the same library, and they put a really loud lawnmower without a muffler outside of the library window. And the experiment went from 50% of people who helped pick up the books to less than 10% of the people. And they said the only difference was the noise. In experiments in Los Angeles, researchers found that children who lived in neighborhoods near the airport could not complete certain tasks undertaken when jets were landing or taking off as easily as children who lived in quiet neighborhoods. And some studies of prison conditions have shown that the high levels of noise causes more complaints by prisoners than the food or other prison conditions do. So noise in our world stops us sometimes from being able to celebrate Shabbat, Sabbath, to be able to relish and hear God. So how do we put into practice Sabbath? Again, I'm a really bad person to ask, so I went to somebody who is doing it. That same book by Ruth Haley Barton, she suggests uh, picking a consistent day, preferably a Sunday in which you can honor the Sabbath each week, And she says, start with what you're not going to do. And she says, number one, make sure that you put work on that list. Work is where we're going to start that, okay? Now, what is that, what constitutes work for you? Let Sunday be a day where you're not checking your email from work, where you're running into the office, um, where you're doing the work that you normally do throughout the week. And already some of you are going, oh, you don't understand my life. I can't do that. I can't, I've got a smartphone. I can't, I can't do that. My, my, my email's always before me, and the expectation of living as a professional in the year 2014 is that when somebody emails you, you're going to respond in a quick manner, and if that's Saturday or Sunday, how in the world am I supposed to do that? And, you know, the majority of people I talk to with smartphones say, I, I really liked it. When I used to be able to go out on a date with somebody, and my, my, my date wasn't staring into their phone. Or I used to sit with my children at the dinner table and I didn't have this going on all the time. Or we used to ride in the car and we'd like talk. (laughs) Or we used to go on vacation and screens weren't a part of it. There was a day and age when minivans didn't come equipped with DVD players and movies to shut your kids up and some of you go, I know it was awful. I can tell you all about it. But there is this beautiful thing that so many of you tell me you long for. And it's that life without the screen that seems so tough. And others of you say, but, but I'm a doctor and I'm on call or I'm a police officer. Or I'm a realtor and I have to be ready to, 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 to answer my clients. And so how in the world am I supposed to not work on a Sabbath? And I learned something in Israel. That 24-hour period began in the evening of one day and ended in the evening of another. And I think there's some wisdom there because it gave people in Israel the chance to answer an email on a Friday and to answer an email on a Saturday. It just didn't happen during the 24 hours of Shabbat. She says, listen, work isn't, you know, this work that we're prohibited from isn't this legalistic thing. If you're somebody who loves lawn work, work in your yard. Work in your garden. Mow the the stinking lawn if that's what you love doing. Be creative. You're an artist and that's just a joy to you. Um, And some people may call it work. Do it. Fine. You're giving yourself a break from that which you normally do. Your regular work. For 24 hours, you're shutting down from that. And it's tough but I think we can do it because God's commanded it. 
Number two, buying and selling. This one's really tough for me. I really like buying stuff. I really love going to uh, restaurants on Sunday. We used to live in a land where we had blue laws that made it impossible for you to go shopping on a Sunday because restaurants and stores were closed. We still see that in some car dealerships and in our post office and other things. There are certain things that remain shut, but for the most part, our society has moved away from this. But when we shop and we dine on Sundays, it means someone else has to work. What if we gave ourselves one day off from being consumers? Would it change the way that we look at consumption? Would it change a little bit of our consumer mentality? When we were in Israel, everything shut down for the 24 hours of Sabbath. You had to buy the groceries because the stores weren't going to be open for 24 hours. You couldn't go eat at a restaurant, and you had to do the cooking ahead of time so you could actually enjoy the day. Again, Sabbath takes work, but it's beautiful when you're in the 24-hour window. Here's the third part. I love this. She says that you're not going to worry on the Sabbath. And some of you go, I'll be really nice. You don't know me. I've got anxiety disorder with a capital A, and I don't know how to not worry. And I do get you, okay? Talk to anybody in my family. They will tell you I struggle with anxiety. I struggle with worry. And this is perhaps the part that I'm looking forward to the most about Sabbath. She writes this. There are more kinds of work than just physical work. There's also the emotional and mental work that we're engaged in all week long as we try to figure out everything in our life and make it all work. The Sabbath is an invitation to rest emotionally and mentally from things that cause worry and stress. Taxes, budgets, to-do lists, wedding planning, major decision-making, and the like should be saved for another time. If we observe Sabbath on Sunday, perhaps Sunday evening after dinner is a time that we can, from a place of rest, engage in some of the decision-making that needs to be done. So again, if you think about that Sabbath as a 24-hour period that starts in one evening and ends in another, doesn't that stress you out? doesn't mean that on Monday morning you can't be prepared for going back to the office. doesn't mean you can't be prepared for paying that bill that was you know, due and you got to get it done. You can do that. But we're inviting you to take a day where even worry is just forgotten about for a day, given to the Lord. Take a vacation from some of those problems. All right, so what should a Sabbath time include? Again, from Barton, always should include some resting the body. Now, for some of you, this is taking a nap. I I know people who Sunday afternoon, it's just nap day for them, and that's what they love. And I know others who say having a nap is like prison to me. I don't want to be in my bed on a beautiful day. I want to go out and I want to ride my bike or I want to run or I want to do rigorous exercise. Whatever it is for you that rests your body, you do it. Maybe it's reading a book, doing art, taking a walk, riding a bike, gardening, sharing a meal with family and friends, listening to music, playing guitar. What is it that brings rest to your body? You make sure that that Sabbath, that 24-hour period that you've given yourself, it might be the only time you truly have all week to give yourself some of the rest you need that you include that in your day. Number two, replenishing the spirit. Different than resting the body, replenishing the spirit deals with that which renews you and brings you joy. It's delighting in the things that God has already given us that are gifts from him intended for our pleasure. Is there a a favorite spot in your home that you like to go to replenish? Is there an activity which almost always helps you feel better? It's an opportunity for us to say, you know what? God gave me the couch that I have today. And while it may not be my favorite couch and it maybe might be outdated and I might want to buy a new one someday, I'm going to relish the fact that I've got a couch that I can sit on today and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to read a book that's in my library, or I'm going to watch a flick on Netflix on the TV that I already have, and I'm going to thank the Lord for what he's already given me, and I'm going to replenish my spirit in the way that does it. And then finally, restoring the soul. Perhaps the most significant gift that the Sabbath offers us is an opportunity to restore our soul. Barton writes, this is the part of us that gets most lost during our work week, which is governed almost completely by the value of productivity. Of course, you want to include some worship and community. But it's also good to incorporate some of the aspect of worship that is more personal to you and to your family and your Sabbath observance. There's this personal sense that we have of spending time with God on Sabbath, but there's also this corporate sense of spending time in community with God's people. And then there's this sense, if you're a mom or a dad, and you aren't past that point where the marbles are gone and your kids are gone, that 
we've got to recognize that God's given us this opportunity with our children to show them a better way of living than what most of the world lives like. She writes, pay attention to how you express love to each other on this day. Identify rituals or shared activities that create a spirit of reverence for God on this day. Have a special meal preceded with a scripture reading. Light candles and go around the table and talk about where God seems particularly present to you during the week. Talk until the candles burn down. She says, um, turn off the TV, talk with each other, take a walk together after dinner, play games, write or call far away loved ones. Open your home to a friend, family, or neighbors. Again, whatever it is for you that's going to allow you to restore the soul. But there's some family and there's some God in that. And, you know, I read that and I get excited when I think about what a true Sabbath could mean in my life. And I told you already, I'm committing to taking this adventure this year. And I invite you to come with me on this journey. You may need to take some time to prepare yourself with where to start. I'm still in that process. I'm praying about what it is that I'm not going to do on a Sabbath day. I want to write down the things in my life that I know have brought me joy in the past and things that I I believe are bringing me joy today. I know that rest and restoration of my soul are a part of it. And then I want to encourage you to put down a date that you're going to start. For some of you, you can say, I'm doing it. Some of you can say, it's going to be next week. For some, I I need a month. But don't ignore it any longer. I want to close with these words from Mark Buchanan. The Greeks had two words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos was the Greek god of time. The art throughout the ages has depicted him as this vile, child-eating cannibal. What a great picture for a Greek god, huh? But that's time. He represented the fleetiness of life. We can never have time back. Buchanan writes that Kairos represented time as a gift, as an opportunity, as a season. It's pregnant with purpose. In Kairos time, you ask not, what time is it? But what is time for? Kairos is the servant of holy purpose. There's a time for everything. Ecclesiastes says it well. In a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And if we are not living our lives on purpose, asking what time is for instead of what time is it, we miss out on what God's trying to say to us. My prayer is that you'll take God up on his offer of rest. I pray that you'll begin to obey God by obeying the Sabbath. May you look at your time and see where you need to say no to good things so you can say yes to the best ultimate rest for those of you who haven't discovered that yet ultimate rest comes from jesus christ i've told you in these three weeks in genesis the genesis is god's story everything in genesis points to the messiah jesus who's coming and in matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 jesus said this come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Through Christ, we can find rest for today, hope for tomorrow, and satisfaction and joy that can be found nowhere else. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus in whom our ultimate rest is found. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath in which this weekly sacred rhythm that you set up in which we cease our normal work and we focus on the gifts that you have given to us in family and friends and most importantly you in worship and the material blessings that you've given us and enjoying what we already have. God, we just pray that you'd help us to be people who understand the magnificence of Sabbath. And may we pursue it with everything that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we close in worship.